Yes, that is downtown Seattle behind me, and it's Are you thinking about living in the Seattle, Washington area and you're wondering what it's really like? If you're thinking of moving here to Seattle from someplace else and you want to discover the lifestyle and everything that we enjoy and some people try to keep it a secret about the Pacific Northwest, but we are going to blow the lid off that. You are in the right place. We are going to talk about what it's really like to live here. I grew up in this area and I'm going to tell you all my favorite things to do. Plus, uh, if you need to get oriented to the food and the culture, what the people are really like, how to act and what you can expect that might be different than other parts of the country, we'll touch on that and we'll go into work and employment and entertainment as well. So. You'll have the full picture of what the Seattle lifestyle has to offer. So whether you're moving to Seattle from out of the area or just plan on visiting here, or maybe you already live here and you just are you're looking at different neighborhoods, no problem. We'll get you started on the right foot. I'm Emily Cressy, a local real estate broker, and my goal is to help you enjoy where you live. Whether you're renting by or you're just curious, I want to help you get started on the right foot so that your Seattle experience is a success. Uh, if you need help, call like other people do. Call if you have questions, leave them in the comments here. I'll make my email available, whatever you like. I strive to answer every single comment. So uh, I love you, I want you to be successful, and this is one of the ways that I have of giving back. So make sure you subscribe to the channel right now. We're doing different neighborhoods each week. We're doing in-depth looking at different angles of the Seattle market. So subscribe, tap the bell so you'll get notified as we release more videos just like this one as we're exploring what it's like living in Seattle, Washington and all the suburbs like Linwood, Everett, Bellevue, Redmond, down south, Renton, Burien, those types of things. So let's go ahead and get started. From summer festivals like Seafair, which are replete with pirates, hydroplane racing, the Blue Angel Navies, the Blue Angels Navy <laughs> flights uh, doing displays overhead. We've got fireworks on the 4th of July and New Year's, boating, water skiing, fishing, hiking outside, cross country skiing, downhill skiing in the winter. There is a lot to do in the Seattle area. We are known as an area many people come to from out of state and even out of the country. Only about 30% of folks living in the Seattle area are native to the area. What that means is that about one third was born here like I am, about one third are from somewhere else in the country, and about one third are from out of the country altogether. And you might be asking yourself, well, why do so many people live in Seattle who weren't born there? And the answer, my friend, is jobs. We have a large number of employers in different industries and we have a lot of high paying jobs. The greater Seattle area, which stretches from Everett in the north to Mar you know, Marysville area, Everett in the north, and then we've got Bellevue to the east of Lake Washington and the east of Seattle, and then south to Tacoma, Washington. This Puget Sound area has nine of the state's 12 largest employers. These include Boeing, the airplane manufacturing company, which has locations in both Everett and Renton. I live in the Shoreline area. My neighbor works for Boeing. Actually, two neighbors work for Boeing. <laughs> You want to go all the way across the street and there's another guy. So they're an absolutely huge manufacturer. Then um, in Redmond, we've got Bill and Melinda Gates alma mater company, right? Microsoft. So they're huge. Microsoft is huge and it employs a lot of employees and then it also has a lot of contract workers as well, many of whom are from out of the country. Although my brother-in-law worked there uh, as an independent contractor, even though he was local to the area. So, they, I mean, they do hire everybody. I sort of feel like I know Bill Gates. He actually went to my high school, but not at the time that I was there. He went to Lakeside, which is where I went to high school, a great private school in the Seattle Shoreline area. Kind of 145th. Actually, they have a middle school too. They have a building named after Bill Gates and um, his grandparents used to live next door to my grandparents in Windermere, which is kind of a luxury neighborhood uh, north, Lake Washington, or north of the University of Washington by Lake Washington. 
So he's kind of a local hometown boy and then he built Microsoft and Redmond which really expanded the growth of the east side. So Bellevue and then Redmond to the north are both on the east side of Lake Washington when that area has seen a tremendous amount of growth and is actually very popular. And Bellevue has a lot of more expensive property. The same house on the Seattle side will be more expensive on the Bellevue side. And in fact, that's where Bill Gates has his house. There's a neighborhood called Medina, which is uh, in the Bellevue side of the lake, right next to the 520 freeway. And I did a separate video on some of the luxury neighborhoods there in Medina, Clyde Hill, Yarrow Point, Hunts Point. So you can check that out if you're interested in the two to $3 million price point or up. Okay, so before I got talking about my buddy, Bill Gates, right, uh, I was talking about employers. So another big employer in this area is Amazon, which has 75,000 employees in the Seattle region at last check. Now, this year, I know a lot of people have been working from home and that's led to a little dispersion of the workforce. So that may be changing and evolving. Also, um, Seattle occasionally toys with making laws that like taxes, I would say that Amazon doesn't like. So they're looking at reconcentrating in Bellevue and some of the other suburbs, not just their downtown Seattle locations. But they are still here, both the, um, the retail offices and then like the Amazon cloud offices. And of course, lots of distribution centers, warehouses, things like that. So Amazon is a huge employer for both tech and non-tech related jobs. If you're interested in tech jobs, check out Google. They just built a new uh, downtown Seattle location in the South Lake Union area across the street from the Mohai, the Museum of History and Industry, which is on uh, Lake Union. So that's a, a lovely facility I've been in there. And then Facebook has offices here too. So there are a lot of tech workers in this area and uh, that's one of the things that's really driven the downtown economy quite a bit in the last couple years. Um, and now if you know they're not having to lease and live downtown, we're seeing a little bit more dispersion and where people are choosing to live more. The suburbs and longer commutes are not as threatening when people are working from home. So in addition to tech jobs, we also have hospital jobs. Swedish Hospital in Issaquah, also on the east side, is a big employer. Then we have the UW Medical Center on Lake Washington, which is just north of downtown. We've got Virginia Mason Hospital, which is where I used to go. We have Harborview, which is a big trauma center hospital in downtown Seattle. There's actually an area in downtown called Pill Hill, also First Hill, which is uh, related to the idea that there are lots of pills being sold there because there are lots of doctors working in that area. At least I don't think it's any kind of illicit substances. If anybody thinks differently, you let me know in the comments. Okay. Another huge employer on the list is the Port of Seattle, which includes our international SeaTac airport. Uh, it includes the huge container ships that come in from China and other international ports and load and unload here. We've got big cranes. They kind of look like dinosaurs. They unload all this cargo from the ships and put it on trains and trucks. We've got uh, railways that transport a lot of those goods as well. So there are big employers. There's also a port of Tacoma, uh, similar concept. They also help with the cruise ships and things going to Alaska. So having the water and the, the commercial ports is certainly a big part of our economy here in Puget Sound as well. So another thing to look at is schools. A lot of times people are being trained in their college or university and then they graduate and they stay in that area and they look for a job in that area rather than going back home. So if you look at this area, there are a number of universities, including the state's largest public university, the University of Washington with 50,000 students. Go Huskies, right? They have a big football team. We used to go down to the women's basketball games when I was on a basketball team in high school. They have uh, baseball games that you can go to. Uh, all they have gymnastics actually my kids took gymnastics classes here in mount lake terrace cascade elite gymnastics my kids were not elite gymnasts but uh when we were there uh who was renting and using the space but it was the husky men's gymnastics team so they were absolutely fantastic and very fun and exciting to watch when i also wasn't watching my kids working on their somersaults 
it was nice for my son to be able to see what he could aspire to do once he was strong enough to do push-ups and chin-ups and things like that. Going back to colleges, there's also Bellevue College, Seattle U, and about eight other community colleges and smaller schools here in the area. So the good thing about having so many employers, oh, there's Bastyr, which is kind of a cool natural health graduate school for doctors, naturopaths, um, that type of thing. Bastyr is actually in Kenmore, which is uh, their campus is adjacent to St. Edward State Park, which I love to go to. So I see them and they have a little cafeteria when it's open, you can go in and eat lunch there and they have a greenhouse and they learn about herbs and different things. That's kind of cool. So we have a lot of schools. And the nice thing about having so many employers and so many industries is that we are a non-fragile environment. So even if you lose your job, you can get another job. If you're in an industry that falters, like the cruise industry is not doing well right now, or you know, airplane manufacturing is struggling, then there are other employers who maybe are on the ascendancy and you can offset that by shifting into a different industry as compared to the, you know, the, the company town where you know everyone works at the mine and they live in the town and when the mine goes dry you know the whole town folds up so we're non-fragile we're kind of the opposite of that due to our very diverse economy here in seattle and it's also nice because you run into all sorts of interesting people and it affords us a lot of different things activities and events and that type of thing to do so let's talk about events because when it comes to defining the culture of an area. Some of the things that make the biggest impact are what kinds of events and entertainments are available in the area. In the 90s, when I was very young, very young, um, yes, in the 90s we were known for grunge bands and skateboarding, and we had bumper shoot, you know, lots of dreadlocks, and big summer music festival, and we had the Taste of Seattle, which was cool. The, uh, the taste of Seattle's where different restaurants would come and give you like a small portion, like, you know, here's one of our famous desserts or here's two of the ribs that we make and that type of thing. So you can go around and sample little tapas sized plates of things that you wanted to try from different famous restaurants. And um, one time we went there and got really full and had a difficult ending to the day, but the strawberry shortcake was good while it lasted. I don't know if I should have shared that story. Well, don't worry now, the Taste of Seattle uh, is some of the events have been curtailed for practical purposes, but there are still a lot of folks living in Seattle, Washington and uh, looking for things to do, setting things up. Um, I have actually a newsletter that I write every weekend curating different things that are happening in the area, hikes, Easter egg hunts, museums, art, uh, going to the beach and learning about the animals. There are all sorts of different things to do. And I make these kind of available on a weekly basis just to get people thinking outside of their comfort zone. You know, we tend to get in a rut, whether that's sitting on the couch, playing with our phone and drinking coffee, whether it's going on a bike ride every week, you know, different people maybe have a different set of things that they rotate through. But my goal with this newsletter, it's called Let's Go Seattle. The idea is to expand your horizons and help you to think of different things. And it's really nice for me because even through, you know, all the difficulty in the last couple of years, we've been able to find new things to do, whether it's meetup groups and online things or outdoor activities and uh, meeting people and connecting with people is so valuable, especially here. I don't know if I should tell you about the Seattle freeze or if that's going to come later, but we have a little bit of a bad reputation for something called the Seattle freeze, which is this idea that people here are not friendly. And, you know, maybe it's because we're all introverted and it's all rainy and gray and we're just like going around hunkered down in our hoods, trying to stay dry and not really going out of our way to like smile, look people in the eye, hold the door for people. Those types of behaviors aren't as common or ingrained maybe, you know, just different cultures, the mis mismatch of things, I don't know, but we are known for this Seattle freeze. So that's another thing about doing a meetup group or a club or a sport or a church or something that you can find where you can go on a regular basis, get to know people over time, connect over shared interests, shared values, and um, 
yeah, just get out of your rut because you're not going to meet new people sitting on your couch drinking coffee and playing, I don't know, Crystal Crush on your phone. Is that Candy Crush? So I do different things on my phone, but I do them on my phone on the couch and it's better for me to get out. <laughs> and so well, that's one of the reasons I do the newsletter is to encourage me to get out and do stuff with my kids and you as well. So uh, if you would like to see what that's about, I'll put a link in the description. But anyway, yes, beware the Seattle freeze. It's not that bad, but you do need to go out of your way to make friends. It won't just magically happen. Okay, so we were talking about events and things to do. So one of the things that I like to do is go to uh, the f like a parade on the 4th of July. There's one in Bothell, there's one in Edmonds, there's one in Everett. There are a lot of different kind of community-led parades, often midday, and then fire public fireworks shows at 10, 11 o'clock at night. So uh, 4th of July is a really nice, usually great, warm, you know, 80 degree weather, sunny, beautiful day to be outside and kind of connect with the community that way. Um, I love Seafair when that's happening. Seafair is over a month and they have different types of parades that they do. They have these hydroplane races. They have the Blue Angels, some of the things I talked about before. And there are a lot of events, a lot of community building events. My dad and my sister did a 5K, the Seafair 5K fun run. And I think they ended up eating donuts during the race. So I don't know that they were trying their hardest to win, but I do think they had a good time and they got a t-shirt. If you like to run, whether you're a marathoner or like a walk jogger or just want to get out with your dog, there are lots of 5Ks, 10Ks, marathons, half marathons, a lot of um, you know, bike rides with the kids. There are things to do to get you outside and kind of encourage you to train. Uh, we are, I would say, a fairly health-oriented type of community. There's a lot of people interested in natural health. There's a lot of people interested in uh, primal fitness and healthy living and, and those types of things. And of course, certainly a lot of people who aren't. <laughs> So at Christmas, we usually like to go around and see different places that have Christmas lights displayed. So I made a couple of videos about that. I can direct you to as well. Try to remind me in the comments if I don't post it. But uh, we go to a neighborhood near Ballard. Um, we just go and sort of drive around and see free ones in the different neighborhoods. There's a, a Candy Cane Lane is a number is a neighborhood that's done this in the past. And then there are paid Christmas tree light places you can go to one of which is the zoo. Woodland Park Zoo has zoo lights, which is kind of statues with lights, which are fantastic. And then, um, you know, there are campgrounds and different things where you can drive through. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot to do at Christmas. You can go antiquing up in Snohomish, which is a small town, and they all this, it's like a, a very cute small town. They have the old-fashioned storefronts, and they sell antiques, so it's very... It goes with the theme, right, of having this quaint little old town area and they all decorate their windows for Christmas and then they have um, like business, there's a lot of business support, you know, best decorated window contest and different things to do to get people to come out to Snowmish, which is a wonderful, it's like an hour away, a little day trip kind of a thing. So there are lots of like, meetups with your dogs, dog activities, a lot of people like to go to the zoo, get a zoo membership. Um, if you like to walk, Green Lake is a fantastic place to go. You can walk, bike, roller skate, bring your dog, camp, play frisbee, tan, see and be seen. Uh, Green Lake's fantastic. And then there are a lot of parks as well, which are more like walking through the woods or walking through meadows, but not quite the, the promenade opportunity that Green Lake affords. There are different downtown areas with like a walkable main drag strip. Ballard has been one that has kind of an active pub scene. There's Belltown. Uh, there are some places in downtown Seattle, but I don't know that I would recommend any of those. One of the places my husband and I like to go is Kirkland, which is on the east side of the lake. And they have um, beautiful lakefront parks that are public access parks. You can um, go to Carillon Point in Kirkland, which is, you can actually... Uh, drive there in your boat or you could drive there in your car. They have a fancy restaurant and it's across from downtown Seattle So they could even uh, you know hypothetically go get you in the boat and come back and it could be a fancy date night type of thing But they also have 
kind of a, a planned urban development style downtown where you can walk around at restaurants and walk to the library and go to the little shops and go to the, the bus station and that type of thing. So the downtown area is fantastic. They've got free parking, they've got paid parking, they've got bars and lots of things to do. Uh, but there's a little Mexican restaurant there called Cactus where you can sit outside on the patio and uh, watch the people go by and eat your fresh, somewhat healthy Mexican food. And that's one of the things that we like to do on a warm summer evening, uh, possibly our wedding anniversary or just something more casual. Oh, I was going to say I made a video about Carol on Point and I also, um, I've shown some fantastic like waterfront condo properties where the the condo is right out the door to the water um, that were in the 600,000 range for like a one bedroom so uh, it is a somewhat expensive area but if you want to get in there uh, it has a lot to to um, appeal about it a lot of appeal there we go potato skins got baked potato appeal Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more about food. One of the defining elements of an area is sometimes the food that it offers. New England is known for its clam chowder. Texas has Tex-Mex. And when I first lived in North Carolina, which is where I went to college, they had barbecue. And in fact, here we use the terms like barbecue, grilling, cookout synonymously. It's basically frying hamburgers and hot dogs outside. But in North Carolina, it was only barbecue if you were slow cooking pork or beef brisket or something like that. And they had barbecue restaurants with special local sauces and barbecue fairs. Um, they're the restaurants you could like throw your peanut shells on the floor. And I'm not totally sure why that was popular, but that was an advertised benefit of a restaurant that I went to. <laughs> you eat hush puppies and coleslaw and you're supposed to be able to tell what part of the state you were from by the balance of uh, sweet tomato vinegar flavors in the barbecue sauce. So I brought my husband up here from North Carolina and he still loves to grill and smoke meat. And actually uh, that smoking meat is kind of a, a popular outdoor hobby here today, but I don't think it's really considered a Northwest staple. We'd be more likely to like grill salmon or something if we wanted to do something fancy. So, um, one of the types of foods that we are known for is seafood and being on the Pacific Ocean, Puget Sound is open to the Pacific Ocean, it's salt water. We get a lot of local seafood and in fact many of the fishing boats that go crabbing or fishing or getting salmon up in Alaska are moored here in the off season. So folks, I've heard of folks that were like part-time fishermen and they taught school during the year or something and then they would go up to Alaska for four or five weeks during one of those fishing seasons and you know make 10,000 bucks and come back so uh, fishing is its own industry it's not like we have big canneries along the coast but we do have a lot of fishing boats and you can see those going out sometimes uh, well, pretty far afield. Uh, the, the, the big benefit is that we do have fresh seafood available and it's a feature of many of our restaurants so if you want a a taste of Seattle, like what's the thing to get when you come to Seattle if you want the, the Northwest cuisine. It's going to be something along the lines of uh, grilled salmon or a, a garlicky uh, seafood shellfish dish, um, maybe some field green salad with strawberries and walnuts, a little goat cheese. Uh, those types of things are kind of healthy, fancy roasted vegetables. Uh, look on Pinterest for Pacific Northwest, you'll see it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we do have a lot of those sort of fresh, healthy, from the region types of foods. But what I'm going to warn you about when you go to a restaurant is look out for something called market rates because that's where they don't put the price on the fish. They just say that it, it, the price depends on how much we can buy it for. And that can be expensive, so use caution. Now, of course, in addition to that, we have chain restaurants like Chipotle, which is my personal favorite. If you want to get me anything, bring me lunch, Chipotle. Okay, so we have Chipotle, Five Guys Burgers and Fries, Red Robin, Panda Express, Olive Garden, Red Lobster, Chipotle. Did I mention Chipotle? Okay, good. Um, 
In addition, we have something that seems to have gotten a foothold here, which is a lot of what I'll call Asian fusion cuisine. 15% of the population is Asian, which obviously includes a lot of different nationalities, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, Vietnamese, all that type of thing. We love them all, and they all have a variety of different foods from their cultures that they bring back. So a couple of moms at my kids' school group are Korean, and one of them is a great cook. She turned us on to a few Korean restaurants in the area, and there's a Korean barbecue. And the way these restaurants work is they have a lot of different uh, small plates, little relishes, chopped vegetables, sauces, all sorts of flavorful foods that are kind of in a buffet in the center of your table. And you can have as much of that as you want. You can order a meat or another entree and then use these kind of side items, condiments, sauces, relishes, and, and put them on your food and kind of mix and match. So you have an experience with a whole variety of different flavors in one meal. So that's a lot of fun. Another restaurant that's become popular here in the last couple of years is pho restaurants, which are serving Vietnamese soup. It's kind of like cup of noodles, but fancier. You get a, a big bowl of soup broth, and then they put in noodles, meat, other toppings and garnishes of your choosing. And you can keep it lower carb, more paleo, by limiting the noodles. And then it's almost like a fasting friendly meal <laughs> if you're trying to eat light. I have gone there. It's not my first choice, but it is something that's new, interesting and different. You might have seen in other parts of the country, but it's very well established here. And obviously uh, a lot of what we want in our cold, wet, rainy season is comfort food that's going to warm us from the inside out. So speaking of diets, I'm mostly joking. Uh, there's actually not a lot of appearance pressure here in the Seattle area and I had to put this nicely so I'll just say from what I have noticed people in Seattle care more about what's on the inside than what's on the outside. I wouldn't say we're ugly because I'm from here and I know a lot of very attractive people from here but uh, we are not like Los Angeles where people are getting Botox and extensions and veneers and they have a very high maintenance lifestyle. So what we are is more natural. We're, we're ready to go hiking. We took a shower, but we didn't blow dry our hair because it's still raining outside, you know, that type of a thing. So uh, perhaps partly from like a strong feminist political influence that doesn't want women to be judged by their appearance, uh, partly because we're outdoorsy, partly because it rains so much and their hair is not going to be poofy anyway. <laughs> Um, your look your look is not as high maintenance in most instances as people from other parts of the country. I remember when I was in North Carolina, you really had to get dressed up. You had to wear like a dress or a suit or something to go to church, uh, to go to fancy things. And here I rarely see people with full makeup. I, really, I rarely see people with curled hair or high heels. Yeah, maybe I'm just not running in the right circles, but here with uh, people wearing lipstick, we are ready to go. I mean, that's fancy. So going into the office, women might wear a dress or nice slacks or some chunky jewelry. Men might wear khakis and a button down shirt if they're being fancy. Uh, very few jobs require a full suit and tie and most don't have much of a dress code at all. Amazon is here. And, you know, the tech guys in the office can pretty much wear all manner of things. My husband has his capsule wardrobe built around polo shirts and jeans. And um, that works out very well. And he's one of the better dressed people at the office. So what I find myself is that it's important to invest in a good coat, <laughs> especially if you're going to be out of the office uh, on a regular basis. So if you're going to be seen outside at all, because of the rain and the mist we get about eight months of the year, you may find that you want to wear a lightweight rainproof layer that will keep you warm and dry about 80% of the time. So what I have is like an outer shell of a jacket that's rain and windproof and fairly lightweight. And then it has a zip in fleece jacket that's a liner. So that's a little extra insulation. And that's my winter coat is when the liner is in. And then of course, get it big enough so that underneath you could wear a sweater or something if you needed to but that's about the extent of my winter wardrobe I have a hat for when it snows I have a hat and glove and scarf but for most other days I just have my 
I wouldn't even call it a parka. I would call it a North Face coat with a zip-in fleece liner and jeans, and you're going to be fine. Now, let's talk about that weather because we do occasionally get snow. And what that means is that you can stay home from work and sit on your couch all day because Seattle can't survive snow. <laughs> We don't often need to wear boots. We don't often need to wear sundresses. We build our wardrobe around casual and business casual and dress for temperatures between 50 degrees and 70 degrees and you should be covered for most situations. Now, yes, in the past, we have been known for wearing socks with sandals, but no, I don't do that and I don't think it's it's current anymore that was more of a high school thing so remember that the reason people were doing that was to keep their feet warm in their tevas and birkenstocks even though it was only 50 degrees and rainy outside so if you get all your clothes at rei you'll fit right in men full mountain man beard flannel plaid shirts shirts are encouraged for any occasion um, lumberjack axe is optional and um Seattle is just kind of a judge not lest ye be judged type of environment, but uh, because there's not a strong sense of style, uniformity, uh, it can lead to other forms of kind of social signaling about what kind of a group you're in. Many groups tend to stick to themselves. And also I will say that with the amount of vagrancy and rambunctiousness downtown and a potentially kind of busy introverted workforce, you can get a lot of the keep to yourself vibe. I mentioned that before, it's just, it's known as the Seattle freeze. So you might just feel like people care more about looking at their phones than they do at connecting with strangers, but just imagine that they're trying to block out the crazy and there's plenty of that that's crazy. Now, when I was a kid, my dad was reading these John Wooden books about aerobics, and so we would go jogging and on walks and things all the time. It turned out to be very helpful for soccer and cross country, but a more lasting thing that he taught me while we were out doing this together was as we passed people, we should say hello and greet them and try to make eye contact and actually like acknowledge their personhood. But this is somewhat of a rarity here in the Seattle area. On the other hand, when we were downtown at his office in Pioneer Square, uh, you know, we were having to dodge shady characters and, um, you know, work safely to get into his office after my mom would drop us off on the sidewalk uh, when he was taking care of us. So, uh, yes, just be aware of your surroundings and if. Uh, if it's a shady character, be careful, and if it's someone that looks nice, you might have to be the first one to say hi. I'm also going to say there's just not a, a standard for common courtesy. I, I found it much more abundant when I lived in the South. There was sort of an expectation that um, people would hold the door open for you. If like an elderly person or a pregnant lady got on the bus, they would like get up and offer their seat, that type of a thing. So. If you're already living here, I'm going to tell you, good job, step it up. Let's think of other people. If you're new from the area and that's your vibe, good. Let's raise the bar, keep that going. But it's not commonly seen in this area. So uh, now I'm going to talk about crime. And this can be a little controversial. So a lot of people wonder, is Seattle a safe area? Is there crime? Are there better and worse pockets? That type of a thing. And so what I want to do is share this map from Neighborhood Scout. This site compiles a lot of useful data and this is the crime map that they have. So you can also find out about crime in any specific area that you're looking for by calling your local police station. So if you said, you know, I'm looking at buying 123 Main Street, what's the crime level there? They would be able to give you a specific up-to-date report on what type of crime and how frequently crime is happening. Now, I live in the Burbs out in Lake Forest Park, just north of Seattle, uh, near the north end of Lake Washington, the shoreline area. We have plenty of property crimes like car prowls, packages being stolen from the front porch, mail being taken out of the mailbox, things like that. But I have never felt unsafe. I have never been a victim of a crime that I know of. But, um, you know, my, my neighbor on a secluded lot has been robbed twice 
in the last 40 years. And uh, one time the robbers were caught by the neighbors. So like the neighbors saw something going on and called the police. So people do look out, out for each other and um, crimes do happen. But like I said, I've never felt un unsafe or threatened or anything like that. Now, here you can see on the map, uh, the dark areas are bad. So more crime is committed there. The higher crime areas tend to be along busy streets where there's a lot of shopping and bus access, a lot of people roaming around, but maybe not a lot of wealth. So we tend to see higher crime rates along Aurora Avenue and North South Street parallel to I-5. It's also known as Highway 99. Uh, once you get into the Seattle city limits, you'll see prostitution going on there. Uh, you might not. I have seen what look like prostitutes there. Uh, there's shoplifting. Uh, there can be holdups. Uh, people can make their getaway on the bus. <laughs> Um, also similar in the Northgate Mall area, there are a lot of people there, there's a bus stop, there's a light rail, people are coming and going, a lot of people passing through, retail, that type of a thing. So this area should actually be getting nicer. They're currently working on revamping that Northgate Mall area, which was the first mall in North America, so a very old and outdated. So they're making it into a hockey practice arena and they're keeping some, some of the stores there and also They've got a movie theater, uh, restaurants, and like I said, bus and light rail. Going down again uh, further south toward the University of Washington, this is a very urban campus. There is a fair amount of panhandling and drug use in the area which can create problems. So that is sort of, you know, crazy things happen. Um, in downtown Seattle, by the tall skyscrapers that you'll see, like the, you know, the pictures of Seattle. This is the most high, high crime area. There's a high population density. There's a lot of homelessness. There's drug use and some violent crimes have been committed here over the past few years. Um, it's not to the point where I wouldn't go there, but I wouldn't make it a destination to hang out there at night. In some areas, even if I were going during the day, I would feel more comfortable with my mom or my sister or another person to be with me. But I mean, that just could be getting accosted by a random person that's out of their mind talking to you and you don't know what's going on. So just, is it just sort of a strength in numbers thing? No one's ever actually threatened me, like I said before. So going south of that skyscraper area that's called South Seattle, this area has historically been a lower property value area. We have the port of Seattle, the stadiums, some industrial areas, Boeing, but this is being quickly revitalized with a lot of new construction coming into the area. Uh, some as part of the high density housing drive along the light rail track. So we are in the process of building our light rail. Part of it is working and um, the part from the SeaTac airport into downtown Seattle is working. And so builders always want more apartments and high density housing, townhomes and that type of the thing along the light rail so people can walk to the stations. Now there is a fair amount of waterfront property in South Seattle. So we have along Lake Washington there. And then we also have along Puget Sound, which is called West Seattle in that part of town. And those are more high rent areas, pretty much any place that you can see water or are on the water, you're gonna be paying a premium for that type of property. And obviously when you pay more for your house, one of the benefits may tend to be a better, safer location. You know, you're surrounded by other million dollar homes. That's gonna to tend to be good for the property values and the safety because I just think so. I don't know if I can say any more reasons without running afoul of uh, fair housing. So going back to what I was saying about South Seattle, they are revitalizing it with a, not, a lot of new construction coming into the area, especially uh, along some of the light rail tracks. They've got the north-south leg going and eventually they're going to be going uh, east to west over Lake Washington as well. So the lowest crime areas tend to be in the high rent districts along the waterfronts. Typically, when you pay more for your house, one of the benefits may be that you're buying into a better, safer location. 
But I want to say again, I have never been troubled by crime or criminals in the Seattle area. When I was in high school, I used to go down to some of these areas on a Saturday night, Capitol Hill, hang out with my friends, eat ice cream, get Mongolian food. We did all sorts of safe, nice kid stuff, but we were hanging out in you know, a populous downtown area. So it's just good to keep your head about you, your wits about you. Uh, don't walk down dark alleys alone. Have your keys ready when you go to the car. Stay with your friends. Stay in well-lighted areas, that type of thing. So, you know, be safe. All right, let's switch on to a happier topic. Some fun things to do around here, and then we'll wrap it up. So, when my kids were young, I spent a lot of time trying to entertain them. <laughs> And I grew up as a kid in this area, so let's talk about some fun evening and weekend options that you could do alone or with your family, etc. So, first of all, I think if you have kids, I really encourage you to look into after school sports. There are a lot of options and uh, it helps kids connect and uh, get exercise and those types of things. So, soccer is huge around here. Some areas, like I think of Texas, as being really big into high school football, but here we're really big into high school soccer and both women's and men's soccer are very popular. We have a professional soccer team. Uh, rowing is also one of the more unusual sports that we can take advantage of here with all of our water, but uh, certainly not everyone would choose to do that. So uh, there are crew clubs and that type of thing typically starting at the high school level. So of course there are all the other normal high school sports, but those are a few favorites. If you have young kids, it's a good idea to think about how you might like to spend your time on the weekends, especially during the winter months. Think overcast skies with intermittent rain. What do you want to do? Do you want to go outside and hike? Just put on some waterproof layers and go for it. It's not going to be that cold. It's just going to be a little drippy outside your hood. Uh, would you take your dog to the beach? You could go to a dog park and run around, let them run, you know, fetch the stick in the lake or in the sound. Are you interested in jogging, hiking, bicycling? Cycling is actually pretty popular here amongst adults, and a lot of people like to bike on some of the trails by which are paved trails like the Burt Gilman Trail and the Interurban Trail. So I see people doing that on the weekends and also going through a lot of the back roads and Issaquah, which is they've got wine, you know, wine country there, tasting rooms and that type of thing, Redmond. So there is some beautiful scenery out that way on sort of the northeast side of the lake. There's the Lake Sammamish Trail. There's all sorts of places to bike. So if you think that might be something you could do, you could join a bike club. You could just do it on your own. There's a lot of great scenery here. Horses, we don't have very many equestrian activities, but if you are interested in horses or horseback riding lessons, uh, that's also a similar part of town to head toward, kind of Issaquah out in the boonies uh, to by Monroe. Sorry, folks in Monroe. You know I love you, but we have a friend with a horse who lives in Monroe, and that's where the state fair is, so I think of... Monroe. Um, there's also Auburn, Federal Way, some places south of Seattle that are sufficiently rural, by which I mean the land is sufficiently inexpensive that you can actually have a big enough parcel to have horses rather than selling it off and building townhomes there. If you're not a big athlete or an outdoors person, there are plenty of other classes and things for your kids to be involved in. Robotics classes, Taekwondo, chess club, gymnastics, Board game nights, Dungeons and Dragons, many of our school year activities take place indoors because it can be damp and dark during the school year, but oh, when the sun shines, it's glorious. Everyone heads to their go-to outdoor activities and it can be really great to find a place that you like to walk on the weekends or during the day if you're home with the kids, just a place to get out and get some fresh air even if it's not a perfect day. You can't wait for that or you never get outside. So we need all the vitamin D we can get here. We don't have to wait for the clouds to part or just, you know, stop stop any heavy rain and, you know, find a good window to get outside. So a lot of people who live in the city of Seattle area get zoo memberships from the Woodland Park Zoo and they can go take their stroller, have a contained space for the kids to run around off leash. Yes, I said it. <laughs> they can run off their energy and they won't get hit by cars and then 
I mentioned before, Green Lake is a personal favorite place. We like to go walk, but there are tons of local parks, pocket parks. So if you're thinking about living or buying in an area, check out the local parks because that might be a big destination for you, your kids, your dog, anytime you wanna go spread your wings and be outside a little bit. And finally, I'll mention museums. We have a lot of cool museums. Chances are your kids will eventually get to many of them due to school field trips, but some bear up well to repeat visits and you'll like them well enough that you'll wanna go back. So I really enjoy the Pacific Science Center, which has like a star planetarium theater. They have an IMAX theater for those giant big screen movies. They sometimes show like Hollywood movies there too. Uh, there's a butterfly house you can walk in and see like the butterflies hatching from their chrysalises sometimes they'll land on you sometimes they'll be eating from oranges so that's cool they have dinosaur like animatronic robots they have a science show where they blow things up and they also have a rotating exhibit that has different displays throughout the year so they've had like the chinese terracotta soldiers they've had displays of art made out of legos they had a Sherlock Holmes mystery solving exhibit. They had the bodies exhibit that featured like preserved human bodies. So you could see um, like how, like what's inside of us and what do smoker lungs look like different from non-smoker lungs and uh, all sorts of crazy stuff. So uh, you can get a membership there. If you are visiting, it's a great place to go and visit and um, it can be expensive to go a lot, so they do have memberships if you anticipate coming back. Another cool place to go is the Museum of History and Industry across from the downtown Seattle Google building in South Lake Union. It's called MOHI, Museum of History and Industry, MOHI. And I think that's a lot of fun. I actually got married in the old version of MOHI where um, it used to be more by the Arboretum on Lake Washington and the University of Washington area. So that was actually the venue where I had my wedding ceremony. So I think it's a really cool museum. The new iteration focuses a lot on the, the history of Washington and the Seattle area and kind of how we got here, all of the farming, the different, uh, not farming, the, all of the lumber. We were big lumber area boating, uh, how the city was built, the Seattle fire, underground Seattle. There's a lot of interesting uh, Seattle history and focusing on the natural resources here and how business and industry tied into those to develop the area. So I'm going to give the Mohai a thumbs up. Uh, you can you might hear about the Seattle Art Museum, which is in downtown Seattle. Uh, there's also the Mo Pop, which is a real funky looking building, all different colors and shapes by the Seattle Center Space Needle. That Mo Pop stands for Museum of Music and Popular Culture, and I don't really think that either of those museums has enough on display to keep a family interested for like follow-up visits. So those are not my favorite, they're not my go-to museums. If it's summertime, you don't need to go to a museum, you can go outside. So I suggest the Golden Gardens near Ballard, which is a wonderful sandy beach park out on Puget Sound. There's also Alki Beach in West Seattle, which is really good, um, on Lake Washington. Matthews Beach, uh, the beach in Magnuson Park has a lifeguard there and they have a cool dog park where your dog can actually go down and swim in the lake. And um, also Green Lake has supervised swimming. And in addition to swimming in the lake, they have a very shallow, like 18 inch deep wading pool that's huge. So it's dry in the winter. People might learn to roller skate there, skateboard around on it a little bit, but in the summer, they fill it up with fresh water every day and it's a great place for like toddlers to come and wait around. I remember doing that when I was a kid. I took my kids there full circle. It's very, it's a very cool like community place to get in the water because we don't have a lot of uh, super hot days. There are not a lot of outdoor pools here. So uh, swimming in lakes is popular. A couple of these parks, the Green Lake is one of the only ones that has a wading pool that I'm aware of that's still in use. What they've switched to now is a lot of splash parks, spray parks, spray pads. There's a fantastic one in Edmonds that just opened a couple years ago, but they're all over the place. So if you're here and it's hot and you want water, look for a spray park or splash pad park 
and um, you should find some some really fun ones which are great to take your kids run around bring a friend uh, have a picnic wonderful outdoor opportunities for getting wet in the hot weather oh there's so many good parks discovery park is a huge acreage on the magnolia bluff you can look out over the water onto downtown seattle you can walk for hours and hours you can, you can go down to the beach there's a lighthouse you can roam around in the woods they have meadows old historic military buildings that's uh, an indian star daybreak center native american history history center and preschool i believe so uh, discovery park in magnolia is fantastic the arboretum is fantastic this is again right by the University of Washington uh, sort of football stadium, that area. Uh, there's a huge, huge acreage arboretum implies trees. It has a lot of trees, but there are also grassy areas. Um, at Mother's Day, they have, uh, it's called Rhododendron Way and Azalea Way, and they just have this walkway that's filled with these rhododendrons, our, our Washington state plant. They have all sorts of different colors flowering at this time of year in the spring so we've historically often gone on mother's day to have a picnic at the arboretum they also have a, a japanese garden there which you have to pay some money to get into but it's maintained meticulously as a traditional japanese garden and has a koi pond and a tea house and fantastic to take a look at so there are lots of things to do here you will not be bored uh, you can still go outside even if it's a little damp and have a great time there's a lot, uh, lot to keep you busy. So again, if you are wanting to get our newsletter with ideas of what to do each week, feel free to sign up for that. Otherwise, uh, just keep an eye out. I'm making different videos on different parts of town and I'd love to find out what it is that you are most interested in. So uh, let me know in the comments and we will try to make those videos for you. In the meantime, here are the next videos coming up. Look forward to seeing you on the next one.